we are live, live now. Right. So committee, um, thank you for coming together today, it, um, Senate Government Operations. And I see that uh, Chris Bray got the um, informal memo this morning. I was not on the all Senate call, but um, so with our next meeting, Anthony, Brian, and myself will look more a bit more presentable because um, we understand that it, it's important for us to be professional in these uh, hearings as we would be if we were in the state house. So, That's not the um, way I heard it. <laughs> was, I, was I, I, heard, I, I thought it was just for one on the Senate floor. Yeah. My understanding was that it was for committees also. Is that right, Chris Bray? Um, I didn't see any memo. I just put this No, on. I meant not. He always dresses like that. No, he I, I said unofficial that. because it was discussed, yeah. my understanding, at um, the all Senate meeting this morning. Um, I don't know. These are from my pajamas. And, <laughs> um, so I don't know what to say about the floor. <laughs> okay. We do know that for the floor, we should be. Um, men should be wearing ties and jackets and women should be probably not wearing this. The um, committees, I guess we can decide unless there has been some um, decision about it, but we'll leave that up to the three men on our committee, okay? Well, I just think we have to remember all the time that we are live in a stored YouTube video that will be forever and that we should be how we want to be seen publicly. Yeah, yes. Agreed. That was the point. So um, I see we have Pat Gable has joined us. Is that you down there? That is me. <laughs> okay. And we have Judge Grierson with us. So one of the things and um, Bill Boniak, Sheriff Boniak is also with us. Is Jack Anderson with us? by any chance? Uh, no. No, okay. So Betsy, do you want to um, go over the, there was a the, uh, question brought up by the sheriffs around emergency, the use of the emergency fund that I know is controlled by, it's a county fund, not a state fund, but I thought that um, Judge Grusin and Pat Gable might have some be able to shed some light on it for us. And Jack Anderson, who was the president of the Assistant Judges Association, was going to join us. He is on the agenda. So we'll look at that issue first um, so that um, the judge and Pat can um, leave us if they want to. They're always welcome to stay with us because we don't get to see either of them very often. But um, so Betsy Ann, would you like to walk us through what you've put together? Sure. For the record, Betsy Ann Rask, Legislative Council. Uh, do all the members and the witnesses have access to the language that we'll be reviewing? What's it called? Uh, I just emailed it to you in draft 4.1. It's uh, potential new section five. Uh, Judge Grierson, I included you on that email. It's the same language that I had uh, pointed out earlier that was posted on the Senate GovOps webpage. Um, yep. If you're looking at that draft 4.1, it starts on page five, the new highlighted section five. I have it. Is, is the court administrator, Ms. Gable, are you able to see this also? Uh, not where I am right now. If you could email it to me, I could look at it on email. Sure. But on the document page, it says Secretary of State Emergency Funds, and then it's another one that says DR20095. But you've put it into the, the regular bill? Yes. yes. Okay. It's in two places. Okay. So, committee, okay, I, I just emailed it to the court problems. administrator. Committee, okay, I have what? technical problems, so I'm not able to post right now the document that Betsy Ann is referring to. But I, but I think it is probably the same language that is on the, on our documents page that's listed as SEC X, 
um, yes. emergency funding. So it's the same document, but she's just put it into the overall bill. It's on page 10. Huh? On page 10. Yes. So you can look at either the new draft or the one that's listed on our document page. Okay. So what's going on big picture as I described in the email to you, um, statute in current law provides in uh, 24 VSA section 73, how a sheriff's department gets supported. And subsection A of that uh, section provides that the county provides, generally speaking, provides the sheriff with uh, suitable equipment and supplies and bookkeeping and secretarial assistance. And then the sheriff is to use contract funds uh, to be able to support any necessary salaries, other salaries and equipment and, uh, and funds. So big picture, a lot of the sheriff contract funds goes towards supporting um, funding for deputies, for example. The county budget statute um, in 24 VSA section 133 and subsection E provides for uh, the county's budget every year. Um, there is language in that subsection about having a reserve fund. That reserve fund and statute says that it should not exceed 15% of the current budget presented. What this language is doing would be to allow that reserve fund to be used for the emergency needs of sheriffs. Um, it's a temporary provision the way that it's written. Emergency needs would be defined as needs to respond to COVID-19 and specifically would include, not an exhaustive list, but would include hiring deputies, dispatchers, and other personnel and purchasing equipment and supplies um, to respond to COVID-19. So this language would say to support the emergency needs of sheriffs due to the state's COVID-19 response, a county's reserve funds described in 24 VSA section 133E shall be allowed to be used for the emergency needs of the county sheriff. Um, and that those, the funding of those needs would be in addition to the normal support of the sheriff's department set forth in 24 VSA section 73. The way county budget works is that the statute provides that generally, unless there's some other provision, um, the assistant judges um, allow funds to be drawn um, for, for, from the county funds. Um, so the way that this language is drafted, it's meant to be still have the assistant judges be the ultimate entity that allows these emergency funds to be used for the share or the reserve funds to be used for the sheriff's emergency needs. That's what's going on in subsection A. Subsection B specifically would require any sheriff who rece receives county reserve funds for emergency needs under this section to apply for FEMA uh, for any allowable reimbursement. I understand from speaking with Sheriff Boyniak that right now, um, as, my, I under, as I understand it, the uh, FEMA reimbursement is at 75% at this time. Whether FEMA would reimburse is a separate question, but the sheriff would be required to apply for FEMA for reimbursement if the sheriff did um, access those or the, uh, access those reserve funds. And then finally, subsection C is a sunset. As I said before, is a temporary uh, provision. It would be repealed two weeks after the day that the governor terminates the state of emergency for the state. Um, so that's when this authority to use these reserve funds for a sheriff emergency needs would terminate. So Sheriff Boniak, would you like to um, just give a little bit of background for people who may not um, know why, why sheriffs are losing funding right now? Yes. Um, so thank you, everyone. And thank you for inviting me. As most of you know, um, you know, the sheriff's business side, we rely on uh, traffic control details, especially like right now, we should be starting them uh, and th right, right throughout the summer. And, uh, 
So we're already taking a hit on that. Um, as you know, Pike and every other um, construction outfit out there has been put on hold. So um, we're throughout the summer, we're able to accumulate some monies that, you know, help us through the rest of the year with uh, equipment and, you know, uh, other supplies that the county doesn't uh, pay for. So we, some sheriffs do have a reserve, their own uh, internal reserve fund that they built up over the years, but the other half of the sheriffs do not have that. And, you know, we do have one sheriff who is looking at in payrolls from now, in other words, six weeks, he'll be out of money. So uh, this may be, uh, this may help, uh, depending if this county does have that reserve fund. Um, and the other big part of this is that, you know, any sheriff who does utilize these funds, you know, shall ask for reimbursement from FEMA because of COVID-19. And right now on the statute side, it says 75% reimbursement. However, we've been hearing about 100% reimbursement, whether that happens or not, you know, the county would receive all their money back if it's used. Um, so it's just one, uh, the other portion that we're looking at was uh, not portion, but uh, the small business administration, uh, one sheriff looked into that, uh, some of the loans for uh, payrolls. And since we're a government entity, we were pretty sure we're not able to access the small business administration funds for payroll. Right. So, that's, that's a good part of it. And, you know, we're being respectful, you know, uh, my county, uh, Sheriff Macklin, she sent me an email. She's in support 150% of this. Um, it's, we're working with the side judges, not against them. So um, this, I think this is a very reasonable option if we need it. Thank you. Um, is that a question for, we also have Sheriff Anderson here and I'd like to hear from him. Uh, I just have a question if I may. Um, the, uh, Sheriff, you're also losing the, you get paid uh, for transport of prisoners and given the sort of court actions of ground to a halt, I would assume that was a piece also of your loss of income. You're correct. Uh, you know, we do have many of the departments have state deputies, not everybody, but we do use uh, per diems quite a bit. And, um, uh, you know, right now we're just doing emergency transports only. That's the same with the courthouses too. We usually have uh, uh, anywhere from three to five deputies working daily. Uh, in Orange County, I usually have two to three. Now I just have the one at the court door. So could we hear, um, Sheriff Anderson, do you have anything to add? Uh, I apologize, Madam Chair. I was having some technical difficulties getting in. Um, You're here now. I'm here. Thank you. Uh, so I think Sheriff Boniak uh, covered a majority of it. Uh, the One of the weird twists with how uh, this has kind of come to play, uh, in addition to our transports also being uh, extremely reduced, and we do have a very busy county in that sense, our civil process service is also extremely reduced, um, almost to non-existent, and uh, our fingerprinting services have been uh, uh, postponed. The uh, net effect is that the way we've built out the services that we provide, specifically the law enforcement services, is that we would, um, we're uh, essentially giving subsidization to our commercial contracts uh, in terms of uh, providing government services to towns. So ultimately my dispatch operates at a loss. Uh, that's because we utilize it for a variety of services. About, th I'm gonna go with approximately two thirds of my budget uh, is from my business side. And that's what helps fund my dispatch and all of that work is gone. And so, sorry, what, what county are you in? Uh, Wyndham County. Thank you, Mark. Um, so any any questions for um, them right now and then we'll jump to Judge Gerson. Yeah, I'm just I'm just curious. Okay. I'm sorry. Okay. 
No, go ahead, Anthony, Anthony, please. I'm just wondering how big these funds are, these reserve funds. We're talking about a lot of money. I'm just curious. Is, is it going to make a real difference for you to be able to access these funds, or is it just a small amount? I'm just some ballpark idea of what we're talking about. Mark, if you want to talk about your shop, go ahead. Uh, I'm not sure I understand your question, Senator. I think he wants to know how big, for example, how big is the Wyndham County Reserve Fund? Would it be four thousand dollars or four hundred thousand dollars and would it is it enough of a fund that it would be helpful is that right anthony yes uh speaking with uh assistant judge barnett who's uh, my set one of my side judges uh he felt that with uh, their current funds uh that they'd be able to sustain our payroll in its entirety for approximately three months so i would say it's in the hundreds of thousands Okay, thanks. I had a quick question if I could, Madam Chair. Yep. So the County Reserve Fund, how is that administered? Does that come through uh, John Campbell's office or is it housed in each county? And <clears throat> when you get those funds out and then you apply to FEMA, you'll be putting those back into that same fund, correct? Yes, the Sheriff Boniak, I'll answer that. Uh, each county, uh, you take up to 15% of their county budget. So it's each county. Um, Orange County, I believe, does usually about 10% of the budget. So around 50,000 for Orange County. Um, so if that money would be used, it's county funds and the reimbursement would go back to the county. It does not, this has nothing to do with the John Campbell's office, the state's attorneys okay. and the All right, thank you. Any more questions for the sheriffs? We might have more. Um, Judge Gerson, do you want to weigh in? I, I don't know that this has any, that you have any interest in this or care at all, but we thought we should um, talk to you, hear from you and Pat Gable both. It's not that we don't care. Um, <laughs> I know. I, we understand what the sheriffs, uh, like everyone else, is going through. This is a different, uh, different world we're working in and living in. Um, I don't see, unless Pat sees something that I don't, that this is not a bill that we would um, support or oppose. I mean, it's, it's a, certainly a policy type decision. I would just echo Sheriff Boniak's um, comments as well as Sheriff Anderson that. You know, the court uh, schedules have been substantially reduced. We're down to uh, skeletal staffs. Uh, judges are not, not all judges are in all the courthouses all day long. In other words, we're rotating the judges um, in, in many of the courts, to, reflecting the reduced um, scheduling that's going on. And to a great extent, the incarcerated population that the sheriffs uh, would routinely be transporting the sheriffs can tell me better, I suppose, but I don't think we've been doing any uh, physical transports. It's all, most of the incarcerated population is being processed through video uh, for initial proceedings, rule five proceedings, some plea changes, some um, sentencings. Uh, so I, I would guess uh, that the transport of uh, incarcerated individuals to the courthouses is at a minimum in the last two weeks. And I, and I don't see that changing. Um, the attorneys uh, as well as the courts are looking for different ways of uh, using uh, the video processing. Uh, so quite frankly, the, the issue is to reduce the in and out uh, out of the correctional facilities. That's one of their biggest areas of risk, at least that we've been told. If you take someone out for a brief hearing and then bring them back in, uh, that's that's what we're trying to avoid. And video has allowed us to do substantially that. And we're now operating, uh, video is operable in all of the facilities um, and in the major courts, Wyndham, Windsor, uh, Washington, Caledonia, Orleans, uh, Chittenden, Franklin, Bennington, and Rutland. Um, so we are in where a court, for instance, like Addison or um, Orange does not have access, direct access to video. We're suggesting that they move the proceedings 
to either, for instance, in Orange County, we would move them to either Barrie or Windsor, convenience of the parties to try to process um, those proceedings via video. So we're, we're looking at expanding that use. Um, th 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 those are my thoughts on, I understand what the sheriffs are certainly experiencing and Pat may have some other thoughts. Any questions? For the, well, let's go to Pat first and see if she has any, and then um, we'll see if there are any questions for them. Pat? Well, maybe I could pro provide a little silver lining uh, to the dark clouds in that, uh, as you know, the sheriffs in a way are entrepreneurs. They have to run a business and they have different revenue sources. And the state transports that Judge Gerson was just talking about and the other sheriffs mentioned um, are um, contracts that they have with the executive branch. The sheriffs also have contracts with the judiciary. And we have committed to honoring our contracts with the sheriffs. Um, and therefore, uh, although I understand they'll have revenue streams that have dried up in many ways, at least the court security contracts currently are, are being honored. Um, and I think I may have been uh, before your committee, Madam Chair, earlier, at least mentioning in passing that we're very concerned in general about the viability of the sheriff's uh, businesses and their ability to be available for us for a lot of reasons that had nothing to do with COVID-19. And so now having the COVID-19 uh, overlay I think puts them in a very precarious position. So even before COVID-19, we were advocating um, for an increase in the amount of money that we could pay the sheriffs under our contracts. So I think just as Judge Gerson said, we would in general be supportive of anything that helps maintain the sheriffs as a viable law enforcement uh, group of organizations with whom we can contract and we're, doing everything we can uh, to support the vital service that they provide. Thank you. And as um, you and particularly Sheriff Anderson know, I'd been working on um, an issue around court security and the sheriffs before this all hit. And right. <laughs> I do hope to keep working on that and maybe come up with some solutions. Um, we're, we're with you on that. <laughs> I know, I know. Thank you. So. Um, any questions for the judge or Pat? Sheriff sure, Bonyak. Yes. I just wanted to say to both uh, the judge and, and Pat, Patricia, thank you for all your support. And uh, I know you've been working with us with, uh, you know, with the court security contracts and even the per diem. Uh, so thank you again. And, you know, we will be there uh, and we'll continue to be there. So I just want to say thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, if there are no more questions, does has Jack Anderson joined us by any chance? I don't think so. Okay, but we haven't heard anything from any side judges that they're in opposition to this, right? Have, have they been asked? I mean, somebody circulated. Well, them. Th some of the sheriffs have worked with their side judges, like. Um, Sheriff Boniak has worked with his, and she sent us a letter saying that she was 150% in favor of this provision. So, um, and we did ask Jack Anderson, who is the president of their association. So they have been asked. Madam Chair? Yes. Uh, Sheriff Anderson again. Uh, I did uh, speak with uh, Assistant Judge Barnett as well, who uh, fully supported it. His concern is that law enforcement resources won't be available when we need them most. Um, and uh, he didn't think that Assistant Judge Duff would have any concerns about it, uh, given our uh, uh, being able to go after the funding from FEMA uh, and reimbursing the fund. So my only, uh, thank you, my only um question is should we limit the application to reimbursement from FEMA my fear is that um that FEMA might not be the best place and that there might be some other um COVID related money that could we expand it to just they should apply for COVID relief money that might be 
makes I don't sense. Know. I think that makes a lot of sense. They might even set up something brand new that we never heard of before. So we could say Great. FEMA or other COVID-19 relief funds. I agree. Betsy Ann, you, can you word that in a way that might include other potential funding? Sure, just yeah, adding in almost basically exactly that or any other available resources for COVID funding or reimbursement. Yeah. Allison? Have, yeah, um, Brian and Pat, have you combed the summer? I mean, I assume you have uh, combed the sort of summary of the of the CARES Act to see what was made available for courts and for uh, a sort of law enforcement issues around the courts. I'm going to what? defer to Pat on that one. <laughs> we're still well. We're still reviewing that. Um, the um, there are some issues that might indirectly relate to the judiciary, but uh, I don't have anything more specific than that for you at the moment. And uh, I take it the sheriffs have done that work of looking at the law enforcement pieces and that the, the FEMA looked the best to them because you're, you're right, I don't think the SBA grants would would uh, work for you. Yes, Sheriff Boniak, you're currently uh, FEMA is the most, uh, I guess, reasonable one to apply for. Realistic, yeah. However, we are looking at every grant that's been coming out there. Um, it's not just uh, anything to do with this COVID-19, any type of grant that's coming out there, we are looking at. Um, and I've been kind of the folk, uh, key point to receive a lot of these emails from the federal government. And uh, I've been forwarding to all the sheriffs and making sure that uh, they're aware of, you know, what funding is coming out. There may be another fund uh, they're talking about in Washington, a fourth major fund. Uh, yes, they're, they're not with... having too much agreement on that. <laughs> yeah, I know. You know, that's where it doesn't matter what side of the fence you're on, Republican, Democrat, doesn't matter. We, this is unprecedented, unprecedented times we're going through and we just need to everyone work together. You're right. Have you, but to that end, have you worked with our congressional delegation to make it clear what your needs are? Yeah, Senator Leahy's office is aware. Okay, uh, great. They, we're in touch with them. Great. Okay, so does anybody have, thank you, Judge. Thank you, thank you. Patricia. Thank you very um, much. Unless there are more questions, um, we'd love to have you stay, of course, but feel free to go if you want thank you thank you thank you, thank you we'll say goodbye you. now thanks <laughs> all right bye so committee um do we have do we by any chance have rick gothier here no uh, rick is is not on the phone that's why i am here uh, okay madam chair good thank you um who, who, who's that uh chris brickell from brandon PD, also the chair of the Criminal Justice Training Council. Right. Hi, Chris. So we, um, we're we going to shift here a little bit to that issue. When we um, met last week, there were a couple issues that came up, um, two in particular that we had questions about. One was the issue of the hiring and what we did is we went through what had been S-124 and pulled out things that we thought needed to um, be passed immediately in response to COVID-19. And two of the issues that we didn't know if they were important to pass now or not were, one was the issue of when hiring somebody, the directive to um, inquire of their current employer and the current employer's um, responsibility to, to reply to that. That was one issue. And then the other issue was about the uh, first, should the first um, offense be related, I, I think it's category B, should the first offense be related, be um, reported to the training council or not? Is that important to do now? in response to COVID-19 or can it wait for kind of a medium term, those two? 
So if you, and, and then there was the issue of other issues around the training council and did we need to address any of them in terms of online training or training that could be um, done in other, in other regions and the pipeline and people who were currently in it, how are we gonna deal with them? So those were the issues that we talked about. That's quite a handful of issues that you've, you've just brought up. So yeah. let me first start with the um, first reporting of Category B offenses. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's, uh, my impression is that there's no reason to worry about that at a later time. This has been discussed uh, at the council level prior. It's also been discussed at um, joint meetings of chiefs and sheriffs. And all we're in agreement that it's the proper thing to do for the for them to be relaying first offense categories of category B to the council so that they can document those. Does that so do that we need to, do we need to put that in legislation or do you have the ability to just do it without us putting it in? I believe it would have to be put into legislation. And you want us to do it now? I, I believe that would be prudent, and I, okay. I was under the impression that's what the committee wanted as well. Yeah, yeah, we discussed it. I, I, I thought that's what we thought. You know? Well, I okay. think that what we um, figured was that we needed to hear whether it really was important to do right now or not on those two issues. Brian? And that was my question to Chris. Is there some particular intersection with what's going on right now at this moment in this issue or could it wait until we get back into whatever is going to be considered a normal legislative session? That's that's Understood. the thrust of this whole thing, Chris. Understood. So is it critical? No, it's not critical at this point. And if it were easier for you to settle on that at a, at a later date um, that's more convenient for the committee, absolutely you'll have no, uh, no issues with anybody in law enforcement changing that to a first offense reporting that. When it, when it seems appropriate for the committee is entirely um, up to the committee. There's, it's not critical that that happens during this pandemic right now. Okay, and that, yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Getting, yeah, getting to I the, I'm, go ahead. I'm sorry. Getting no, to the online um, portion. So I, we are in, as you can imagine, a state of emergency in dealing with everything at the academy. Um, we are currently moving a lot of training that was not online to online training. Um, we have a couple of plans that are out right now for the administration to um, look at and as far as how we are going to certify the class that was currently in. And we're waiting to hear back from the administration on the plans that we have submitted to them. We do have a, a plan in place for this class that was in week seven that had been uh, abruptly stopped and sent home we do have a plan in place for them to return if we do have approval and for them to complete their level three certification training. It may take a little bit longer than the initial date was, but if we do have that approval and uh, we've been speaking with the administration and the Department of Public Safety with this as well, that we would like to get all of those officers certified as, as quickly as possible. Um, if not, we, we also understand that the training that we're used to um, just is not available to be able to, to do currently because we can't do hands-on training. We can't test proficiency skills and, and some of those things, but we can give a provisional certification. The council does have the ability to waive certain portions of training um, as long as we give them a provisional certification and when the time is safe for everyone to return to the academy for those proficiency testings and the things that they could not get because of social distancing, we would certainly do that as quickly as possible and get their level three certification done completely. And how many weeks did they have to complete and how many are in the class? They would have had to complete um, 16 weeks and then there are uh, typically about another two additional post basic certification classes that they come back for additional certifications. Um, I believe this class, I don't have the exact number. I want to say it was about 43 recruits that were in this class. So, so the bulk, so they still need to do nine to 11 weeks. Correct. So do you, you have the 
um, ability to just do that without having to have legislative um, and put something in the statutes. Am I right about that? You just need to get the administration and DPS to to um, okay your plans. That that's correct. I believe that the council has the the okay. legal authority to waive plenty of uh, trainings. The only thing that we don't have the ability to waive is the mandatory statutory um, hour requirement of, I believe it's 972 hours of training. That's not something that the council could waive, um, but I don't believe that the hourly requirement would be problematic to getting level three certification because we're going to have to do, even if we are leaving some non-essential training out, there is going to be plenty of on-the-job training and on-the-job um, hourly credits that they will be getting towards that certification. So you don't need us to put something in that says, um, notwithstanding that provision, that during this time you can do a provisional um, and waive the 972 hours? If there was a way for you to draft something that gave us provisional um, ability to waive the complete 972 hours, that would likely be helpful, but I can't give you an exact number of what the appropriate number would be at this point. I could within a day or so, um, but speaking for what we're looking at trying to do and put together right now, I just can't give you a, an, an actual number on the training hours that would be required for you to give us a waiver of. What if we just did a waiver, Betsy, that, um waived the 972 and just said something like um, th with uh, to an appropriate number as approved by the administration and DPS and the training council so that we didn't have to put a number in there would that work it, uh, it would but I would be a little I would be a little concerned I think if you left it as um, with the approval of the council rather than other state entities the council, is basically the certifying body. Okay. And I think it would. I think it would be appropriate if you change that hourly amount with the approval of the council. Hi, Betsy Ann, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, sorry. I'm sorry, Chief. Uh, for the record, Betsy Ann Rass, Legislative Council. I don't. I don't think that hourly requirement is in your statute. I just searched through the chapter. I really think it's all set out in rules. There are specific number of hours for domestic violence training and animal uh, cruelty training and. Uh, racial justice training, I believe, but the 972 is not set forth in your chapter that I'm seeing. Um, it's I really think it, it does come out through the council's rulemaking because the council has uh, general rulemaking authority to approve training schools and offsite training programs, the minimum courses of study, um, the minimum basic training for officers in each level and the time within which that training will be completed and manual in minimum annual in-service training requirements. So I don't think the statute actually specifies the total number of hours. Okay, I stand corrected, thank you. Brian, did you have a question? No, I just saw Betsy was wanting to uh, make a comment. So it sounds like the council already has this authority, correct? I would say so, yes. yes. Okay. Okay, Good. Allison. So, Chris, given that they haven't even completed half their training, um, I, I would hope that a provisional credentialing would be very limited in terms of what they were able to to do. Uh, uh, I mean, they. So, so to your answer on, on that topic, we have already um, the council has met twice in emergency session already. And what we have agreed to do so far is not knowing what the outcome will be to bring these candidates back. We have two methods of how we would like to bring them back. With administration approval, bring them back full time and get their training done. If we don't have the ability to do that, we are going to complete the online portion that, we've, that we're doing currently right now, bring them back for a firearm certification, and a limited amount of use of force training that they've already had. And we are going to give them a provisional level two certification, which at the same time uh, okay. would only limit them to their scope of authority being a level two officer. 
Good. And and the online training would be equate to a, a one or two additional weeks of training. No, what they're doing right now is moving classes that normally would have been um, held in lecture type to an online forum so that the students weren't not they weren't losing a lot of time, and they've also given them additional online training through different sites like JPMA and training sites where they could get um, non-essential training, but nonetheless training that law enforcement needs to keep them busy until we have some sort of answer on where we can go with our training. Brian, did you have your hand up? Oh, okay. So do we need to, do we need to put in anything about the specific number of hours required for the uh, domestic violence and racial training and um, or are you able to um, meet that somehow with online stuff, Chris? Uh, I believe that we'll be able to meet that. Um, even that domestic okay. violence training is something that we'll be able to handle, I'm sure. Okay, thank you. Thank you. So it looks like we don't really need to do anything um, around uh, the training aspect of law enforcement in this bill. Am I right about that? Seems like you know. Yep. yep. Anthony? Yes, I agree with what you said. I do notice, Madam Chair, uh, Colonel Birmingham's in with us. I don't know whether okay. he had anything to add. Oh, I didn't see him. Okay. Colonel, do you have I, anything I, you'd like to add? I do not. Thank you. Okay. Um, oh, sorry. Can I just mention one thing? Okay. Yes, please. Betsy Anrask again, just to mention to the council, maybe something probably want to discuss with your, the council's council, um, is that all of this does seem to be the council establishing its training requirements by rule. So I just wonder if this is something that you would need emergency rules for to deviate from your current rules. But that'd be something that you would discuss with your own legal counsel. But if everything's yes, set out in rule now, it seems like you'd need an emergency amendment to those rules. Okay, do we I need to that. do we need to put that in legislation that they are have the ability to do emergency rules? Uh, no, if if no. the agency finds that if there's an emergency circumstance, uh, for example, not being able to train the law enforcement officers because of COVID, I would think that would be a threat okay. to public health, safety, or welfare. Um, that I, I would think that they would have the emergency, uh, the ability to adopt emergency rules. Um, I just don't, I don't know if the council has discussed that yet or gotten that far as to whether okay. they think emergency rules are necessary. But we, we have don't discussed need to do a it. lot with our council, just not um, any change to the rulemaking process. Okay. But I can certainly do that today. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions on this topic? No. So I guess. No. So are we okay then with Betsy's uh, XXX number S point XXX, whatever our number is to be and where we will put it? Yikes, so that's a different section other than the sheriff's money? No, this is the whole thing. The, she, she emailed us the um, complete, she's got it all put together in one bill now. So 4.1 4. 4. is that draft, and, and it has no law enforcement in it uh, additionally, so, but we haven't heard from Matt yet. Right. Oh, okay. I. Um, so, I mean, I'm, I'm curious, was there anything that Matt was thinking about that was needed that we hadn't addressed? Colonel? Okay. Not oh, right sorry. at this moment. No, thank you. Okay, that that's what I thought I heard you say. Okay, I did okay. too. Um, sorry, I needed to, clearly needed to be refreshed, or maybe I just needed to hear Matt Birmingham's voice again. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so are we okay with that? We just need to find a place for it to live. Yes, that's okay. Do we need to vote? Are we allowed to vote? Yes. Um, we are, <laughs> my understanding is that we are allowed to vote today. Yes. And yes. that then um, tomorrow 
no, Wednesday, the resolution will be um, voted on by the Senate to allow the Senate to vote remotely, at which point we then can have a completed bill that we can bring to the Senate to vote on. But I believe we are allowed to vote. So with that, would the clerk please call the roll? Oh, Madam Chair, may I break in just one second? Yes, I'm sorry, before, sorry to interrupt, but so you have no. this draft 4.1 and then the only tweak to it would be the one that uh, you discussed with Sheriff Onyak in the sheriff section, um, which would be right. in the reimbursement. Um, aside yes. from FEMA, I think you decided on the language being that a sheriff who receives these county funds for emergency needs shall apply to FEMA. Or any other or any other applicable resources for COVID-19 relief known to the sheriff? Yes. Any allowable reimbursement? That sounds perfect. Okay. I'll add that. So that, you wanna make that 4.2? Yeah, sure. Okay, thanks. So then I'll move that we vote out draft 4.2 of draft 20-0950. Thank you, Brian. Are, are, are you wanting, okay, because, do we have enough? Okay, so we're not nope. amending. So it's this is all new, so it's just draft four point two. Correct. Correct. Got and then it. we we will leave it. I I think that what I'll do is leave it to um, Betsy and the pro tem, and if he had wants any suggestions from me of where to put this, how to how to actually make it a bill. We probably have to choose. We probably have to choose a vehicle for it. We we will, and we can look at the the ones that are that currently exist um, in the Senate. I'm trying to think of what currently exists there that might relate to um, EMS or law enforcement or um, sheriffs. We can, we we'll can find something. We'll find a vehicle. Okay. Okay. So Brian has moved that we. So we have we have a motion to pass draft four point two, uh, and uh, Bray, Christopher Bray, are you? Uh, yeah. I left mine on mute there. Okay, Christopher Bray. Yes. Allison, <laughs> Allison Clarkson. Yes. Brian Collimore. Yes. Anthony Polina. Yes. And Jennifer and Jeanette White. Yes. Great. From Jennifer. We have a five zero. I know. I don't know where she came from. We have five zero and the motion passes. All right. Thank um, you, sir. I will. I'm happy to report this unless somebody else wants to. If um, it should be reported by a person who will actually be there, um, that would no, we're, be- We're, not, we're then, not voting in person on Wednesday, remember? We're not doing any bills on Wednesday. I know, I know. But I don't know if somebody will actually be in the state house or if all when we actually do a vote by remote or if all 30 of us will be elsewhere. I, I don't know how- Okay. That's going to work, but I will be happy to report it unless it should be done in person at the state house, and then I won't. Okay. Well, we'll cross that bridge when we find out. Yes. Okay. Now we have amended it. Have we actually approved it since this kind of was a an amendment to an amendment to a non-existing bill? Well, I. I think we need a vehicle. I think we need a number to say you're amending that bill too. Well, yes. So we've, but done, all we can, we've done all we can do right now. We've done right. what we can do at the moment until we have identified a vehicle, a number. I, I think we want to make our vote today the final vote so that we I can agree. attach it to some to a vehicle and okay. use so that. I'm going to pull up the vehicles we might have. Well. Allison, not to jump in, but I think S Senator Ash was pretty clear that his guidance this morning was not to, to, so much to worry about uh, yes. an individual committee finding a vehicle as 
he is going to try to do that, I think, for us. I agree. Can, is, that, is that what you heard too? Yes. Okay. Because I believe that there are other things that will need to be um, passed when we actually have the ability to vote on things. And I he, think he needs to make the decision about whether it should be individual bills or if the, it should be put together. And I believe he will make that decision. So right now we want a final vote on, on this bill, XX. Oh, I thought that's what we were doing. Well, I don't know, but I think that because we're, we usually do and uh, approve the amendments and this has been amended a number of times with different, um, since we started, I mean, we've added the sheriffs and we've added the electricians and plumbers. And so it, it is different than from when we started. So I think that what Brian suggested was that we approve draft 4.1 and now as a, um, S X X as amended by 4.1, 4.2. And now we need, I think, to adopt or to recommend, report out favorably, S X X, whatever that may be. Okay, I'll be glad to make that motion if we need to. Yes, Sorry, I would I, appreciate it. I thought that was the motion that he had already made. Okay. No, we were amending it first. Now right. we're going to vote on the uh, Okay, here's the, here's the motion. I'm, I move that the committee vote out draft number 20-0-0950 as amended by draft 4.2. Right. Apparently right. it's gonna die for lack of a second. Okay. You don't need a <laughs> All right, second. I'll second it. All right, we thank you. Need you don't need a second. Bray? Okay. okay, would you call the roll, clerk? Yes. Yeah. Senator Bray. Yes. Senator Clarkson. Where is she? Yes. Senator Collimore. Yes. Great. Senator Polina. Yes. Great. And Senator White. Yes. Perfect. Okay. It passes. Shoo. Does anybody else have anything to say? About that? <laughs> Yes. So how, how will this uh, language be presented to the pro tem or is that the next step? Well, we, I will send him um, the language as we just, you can do a copy without the highlighting on it. Mm -hmm. and we'll send that to him and say, that's what we passed today. Okay. Yep. And you can send it to him directly. Okay. I'll copy and the to, committee. Yeah. Yeah. Copy the committee and copy and Peter Sterling. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank Madam, you. Yes. Thank you. Madam Chair. Um, yes, Chris. I, I looked at the, the Senate calendar and there is a very skinny little bill on there, S301, uh, relating to repealing the 248A sunset. Um, so maybe that's a, a skinny little thing that can be used that's already on the, the calendar. Who knows? Just mention I, I don't know. I'm that's way beyond my pay grade. Nothing's and beyond I'm, the pay grade. I'm leaving that completely up to the pro tem about how he wants to handle that. Okay. Okay. Right now we're okay. just talking about it as 20 0950. Yes. Correct. Yep. Great. Okay. Committee, can we shift gears here a little bit? No. We are nimble. We are nimble, if nothing else, if I can get to my, um, so we didn't have anything else on the schedule for today, but what, one of the things that um, came up yesterday, we had a, um, an emergency, the Wyndham County delegation had an emergency meeting with uh, Drew Hazelton from Rescue, and they are in much deeper trouble. Oh, first of all, I should thank, um, the Sheriff Boniak and Sheriff Anderson, and you're certainly welcome to stay with us. And Chris also, whoever wants to stay, but I, we are shifting gears. So thank you for coming. Well, thank you thank very you. much. Thank you for your time. And thank Matt, you. And Matt thank yes. You, so and thank anybody's you. welcome to stay and hear the issues that were raised yesterday by, um, by our rescue people. So a number of issues, and I'm going to put these 
out and then I'm going to try to list them and hopefully tomorrow we will be able to have people come in and talk to us about how to deal with these because these are pretty serious issues and I'm just going to run through them and then I'll make a list if that's okay with the committee. Yes. Sir. Does that work? Yep. Sure. I think we lost Chris Bray. Oh no. Yes. There's um, Mount um, something or other. Well, he may okay. have taken a break. Is so it, I had it, a it's want to do dog care duties. So um, <laughs> we have about eighty ambulance services in the state, and most of them are private nonprofit. They are not municipal services, so they will be. Uh, they will not have um, any ability to recoup any funds from FEMA because they're not municipalities. We're trying to figure out um, with if there is any way of working around that, but we think not. The, um, we have, so they, their three main issues are supplies. Yes, Chris? Um, so they, but they do, uh, don't most of them receive uh, municipal funds, you know, like town by town on town meeting day, we vote for them. Could those municipalities act as fiscal conduits for them? We're we're trying to look into that. And what I'm going to ask Chris Campany today, I'm just raising the issues, and we're going to um, invite Chris Campany from R Rindam Regional, who is very familiar with how FEMA funds work, and a number of other people to join us tomorrow to have the actual discussion, because that is one thing we looked at. So there are about 80 ambulance services and most of them are private, I said. They have had um, over the past couple of weeks, they've had about a 25 to 40% drop in calls because uh, calls where they transport people. They've had an increase in the number of calls, but a drop in the number of transport calls because people are not going to hospitals. They're being told not to go to hospitals and because uh, there's no hospital to hospital transport because of um, surgeries that are not happening, elective surgeries. So they're, they, they don't get any, they can't bill for um, just a call. They, have, they can only bill if they transport to a hospital. So their, their revenues are going way down. They've been working with Medicaid trying to figure this out, but so far they don't have any solutions. They are... Um, they have um, a number of people who are, have been in the training pipeline who are now stuck there and can't, just as the uh, police training council had. And so they are in bad straits right now because they can't figure out how to get those people through the training, um, through the uh, training and get them certified. So the, the, um, Personnel is a huge issue. I, I just lost my train of thought there when um, Chris asked right. me that question. So let me back up. You were on issues. Issue, you were on issues, and you had identified yes. supply, issue, supplies. Yes. is the first one. Personnel and funding. That's where you went. Yes. So um, the funding is a huge issue, and they are losing hundreds of thousands of dollars all the time and most of them do not have enough to meet payroll within a nec the next week. They are, um, their calls have gone down, but their calls that they're able to bill for have gone down, but their calls have gone up. And if the state of Washington is any um, indication, they're within the next 14 days, they estimate that their calls that they can't charge for will increase by about 200%. So they're making a lot of calls, but not being able to get any funding for them. So we need to figure out something there. There is the fire, the money, federal money that comes that we had um, identified for training, but that only 2% of that goes to EMS. The rest goes to the firefighters. And they don't want to deplete the money that goes to the firefighters, but we have now those 80 ambulance services who are going to be fighting for that little 2% amount because they 
that's their source of funding. So I have um, sent a note to Jane Allison. Well, I'm just curious, have you uh, spoken to Ginny about what might be in the CARES Act specifically for EMS? No, we. this just came up yesterday. Right. La last night, we had a meeting with them. So right. we're. I'm sending out all the, what I want to do is list all the issues here and then figure out where it is that we go for them. So the, the funding issue is one thing. The personnel issue is is huge because they have these people that are in the training pipeline that they can't get through because they've stopped the training. There is no online training capacity in Vermont right now. And what they would like to do is uh, perhaps use the money that, that 475,000, I think it was, that was in the um, fund, in the firefighters EMS fund, They'd like to use that to perhaps buy an existing online service from some other state. But so far they've met with resistance from the Department of Health and I'm not exactly sure why. They also would like to um, um, do away with the um, exam, having to have the exam before they can um, be certified, even with a provisional certification. We've done that for nurses. So nurses who've completed their um, education, but haven't been able to take the, the, I don't think it's called the bar board, I think it's called the nursing board exam, are being allowed to practice with provisional licenses as if they had passed. We've done that with nurses, but the um, EMS, the man, emergency management um, part of DOH is very opposed to this. And I don't know, I don't understand why, but I'd like to hear from them tomorrow about that, but they're unwilling to um, budge around that. The other issue is we have ski patrol people who are well trained and could be providing that service right now. But again, the department, the Office of Emergency Management Services has um, put up a roadblock and is unwilling to, to look at that. So um, we also have laws, we have no state mutual aid agreement within the state for EMS people. So, and, and that was one of the things that we had put in the bill that we wanted them to, to um, develop. I'm not sure that DOH has the wherewithal to be able to do that now. They're so busy with other things, but it seems to me that perhaps they could, um, they could contract with a couple EMS people to help des design that mutual aid system because right now there is no system that if one area loses their emergency people, they can serve another area. They can't do that. So we need to address that. We also have the issue of, I don't know if you remember when um, the adjutant general was with us and he said that they would not take people from their primary health care jobs in order to serve as, um, in the guard, but the rescue has lost one of its only three qualified paramedics to the guard that he's been called up. So that, that's an issue. And um, one of the things, Department of Health has, has eased up on the um, two, tran two certified people for transport so they can use drivers. So it seems to me that if the National Guard really wants to help, what they could do is they could call up people not who are trained medical people, but who have um, lost their job someplace else perhaps, and they could call them up to be used as drivers in the ambulances to relieve the, the current um, paramedics. So those are some of the, um, their, their Volunteers are down. They do not apparently have access to the governor's volunteer. The governor set up this volunteer um, port. I don't know exactly how it works, 
but they don't, they're not given access to it, so they can't use it. Um, they have increased sick time, so they're losing personnel because of um, quarantines and increased sick time. So the, that's, um, that's the personnel side. Then the supply side is that they were unable to access, well, everybody was unable to access the stockpile of PPEs in um, February and early March. And it's only recently that they've been um, going into the stockpile. So some ambulance services actually bought it on the open market because they need, knew they would need it. And um, so, and they paid through the teeth for it because the suppliers apparently raised the prices sometimes by as much as four or five times, but they, they bought them in anticipation of it. But those who weren't in the position to be able to buy only have about four days of supply for of PPEs and they are um, not sure that they're how they're going to be able to get them because they don't know that if they're going to be um, allocated them the same as the hospitals are the also the other one of the other issues is the decontaminating materials not just the PPEs but the decontaminating materials that they're using on the ambulances is that they don't have access to the, the supply. So they're using what they have and they're using um, materials that are actually deteriorating the insides of the ambulances faster than they might be, but they have to decontaminate them. So they're in a bind here about that. Laura um, Sibelia is going to work through BDC, BDCC the development corporation here to see if there's some um, Vermont company that can possibly gear up to supply, to produce those decontaminating materials. I'm not sure if she can find them or not, but so the, um, so those are, I think the, and they also are not getting the, um, right number of medical kinds of equipment that they need, like the medications and the IVs and stuff that they are going to have to use. So that, those, that's um, just a little bit of an issue of, that was presented to us by yesterday. Most of them will not be able to meet payroll by um, the second week in April. So there we are, Allison. So I have a couple ideas. One is there is a lot of money for medic for the medical world in that CARES Act. And I bet if you and Ginny put your heads together, you could find a, 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 an avenue whereby EMS could, you know, a, an umbrella under which EMS could fit. I, I, I bet there has to be some, I mean, there's such an essential part of our medical delivery system. I, I, I just think there, there has to be a, something for them. The other thing is Silo Distillery in Windsor is producing deca you know, uh, material to uh, sanitize things uh, with, their with their stills. And so we have a local, possibly a local, uh, you know, uh, they could conceivably be asked to focus uh, additional attention for EMS crowd. And then also it strikes me that the National Guard could be called in to help staff some of these uh, EMS uh, uh, groups. It, it, you know, we have the National Guard. They are on alert. They're they're not all been activated, but they're on alert, and they are all better trained in emergency response than the than normal people. So I mean, that they might fill in for some of the volunteers. So a, cu a couple <laughs> things. Our distillery does the same thing down here and okay. i don't and that's what laura was going to check into to see if they're right. if the, if what they are producing can be used and if if there's other companies out there that can produce something that would be less deteriorating on the the ambulances right. themselves the in terms of the national guard that was a suggestion that they that was made is that if they could deploy people who are um not the problem is that if they try to 
get people who are trained, they're taking them from someplace else because most of those people are actually working in the healthcare professions or as Drew pointed out in the EMS system because they've all, so they are, they have taken one of the paramedics from rescue to send someplace else. So what they need to do is take non-certified people who, as you pointed out, do still have some level of training and use them for um, drivers and um, dispatchers or whoever they need. So yeah, and uh, the money thing, I, I do know that they are looking at every single, they are in touch with um, Medicare, Medicaid office and every other office about that. They've all, they're also looking at the CARES money. Right, and the plus of using the National Guard is they're paid. Yeah. So I mean, Brian? they wouldn't have to pay them. Brian? So let me just uh, suggest, Madam Chair, we have Drew already on the agenda for tomorrow, along yep. with Dan, Chris, and Patrick. Perhaps we could add uh, Jim Finger from the Rutland uh, Ambulance Service, and also yep. somebody from DOH. I really oh, would like to hear have, why. Yeah, go we ahead. Shayla, we've, we've tried okay. to get Shayla and Dan Batesy. Okay. Casey, um, to, to join us. And um, Jim Harrison was on the call with the Wyndham County uh, delegation yesterday, Representative Harrison, because yep. the EMS is a particular interest of his. And he was on the call with us and he's going to um, talk to the secretary and we're going to see if we can get the secretary to join us or at least um, have some kind of a response because I'm not sure that he is aware that it is such a, a serious, yeah. that they're in such serious straits, but it okay. is, it is really, so what I'll do is I'm going to try to make a list of these issues in the three categories and put them on. I suggested that if anybody wanted to, who was invited for tomorrow, if they had the chance, if they wanted to listen to us today, they could hear it, but I'll put them those questions and Gail can send them out to, to all those people that those are the issues that we're addressing. Does yep. that make sense? Yes. And maybe, uh, maybe we could add Jen Carby or Katie McLynn, whoever is most versed on the medical uh, cares pieces that we could look at as a funding, as additional funding. Senator White. Mm -hmm. Chris. On um, the mutual aid piece of things, uh, in the last few weeks, we just went through that and Senate Natural related to uh, wastewater, drinking water systems. And so there may be a model there. Well, there's two things we learned about. One, and the whole municipal um, wastewater, drinking water system, there's a thing called VT WARN. It's a mutual aid agreement that I had kind of uh, faded out post Irene and now is getting reinvigorated in order to set up these relationships so that they can loan equipment, personnel, stuff like that between municipalities to stand up services. So that might be a place to get some useful information. The other thing is a VLCT has a model contract already for mutual aid at the municipal level. And so someone's been working on these kinds of mutual aid agreements that, and it, it might jumpstart the work between these private ambulance services. Good, thanks. Yeah, that, that's a great idea. And we can um, see if there's, maybe we'll ask um, Karen Horn to join us to see if, they're, if they can provide some kind of a, a framework, which would save a lot of time with um, Department of Health. Right. Or who else, whoever might. Yeah. Right. Um, and I think Gwen, because she perhaps Gwen, okay. is a lawyer, she also uh, spoke with us about that. Okay. Thanks. Any other suggestions, committee, or issue, other issues that you want to throw in here for tomorrow? I think that's plenty. Yeah, that'll be a pretty full plate. But I think that it is really, really important that we address address these issues. Um, Definitely. All right. So I will I will try to um, right now write up the um, a summary of the issues in the three areas, 
and then I'll send it to you first so that you can look at it and add what you think needs to be added. And um, I do, I'll also send it to Betsy Ann, is that okay? And, and to Gail, I'll send it to everybody just in case anybody has something to add or if I haven't stated it very clearly. My brain seems to be um, No, no, don't apologize for your brain. It's doing, it's doing fine. Um, I have a question for you, uh, if we could. Are, are, is anyone hearing feedback about how our municipal flexibility is working or not? And is there anything additionally we have to do in the COVID response with our municipalities? I think maybe Chris has an issue around marriage licenses, but I thought that right. the, they were working around that. Chris? That was the one. I mean, there's marriage licenses. Um, but before right, I, I, I get all those. back on the, uh, I don't know if you, in your conversation yesterday, how far you got in terms of looking at municipalities as fiscal conduits for these private ambulance services. I mean, that every town is so reliant on it. I don't know if we've ever done something like that before. It certainly seems like a reasonable thing to say all the towns count on the private services. Could the towns that can receive monies that the private services can't, could they then pass it along in some way? That's what we, we just, we posed that question and um, we're going to, that's why we've invited Chris Campany to join us tomorrow because I think he is, there are probably other people in the state also, but I, I do know that he's very aware of all the regulations around FEMA. And if there's any work around that can be done, he would know that. Thanks. Great. Hey, Madam Chair. Yes. <laughs> I'd also say uh, with the list of issues, I'd say to loop in Nolan from JFO also. Um, yes. Good. Nope. Nolan would be a good person. That's right. He's Thank you. The list. He, he wants to join us. Good. Thank you. <laughs> Somebody wants to join us. <laughs> no one always wants to join us. <laughs> okay. Is there anything else, committee, that we need to? I will try to get these done right away and send them out to you. And then um, Gail can send out to the people and who we've suggested inviting is Department of Health and maybe the secretary and um, Patrick Malone and Drew and the adjutant general and Katie or Jen and Nolan and Gwen. Anybody and Chris Campany, anybody else? I forgotten i suggested jim finger who's oh, yeah, the yeah. Uh, Rutland regional ambulance guy yeah great he's the one that was so um seemed so incredulous when i waved my wand yes is that right betsy ann <laughs> and and then he was even more incredulous when it worked <laughs> <laughs> the highlight of my session yeah, well, ours was when you were um, explaining the triple whammy. <laughs> I'm missing your wand. I'm, I'm missing my wand, too. I, I, I think this emergency, I think you should always grab the wand first because every emergency needs magic. I didn't know I'd be gone for so long. I know. I know. I All my clothes and everything is still up in the apartment in Montpelier. And I don't I think I go back that. up. I know. Ours is too. Yeah. Yeah. Oh well. Oh well. Good thing I have two toothbrushes. Yeah. <laughs> um, anything else, committee, before we Gail? Oh, are you waving goodbye? Or Katie and Jen that you were talking about? Um Jen um Carly, Carly. or Katie McLean. Oh, okay. First counsel. When you said I'll say Jen. did you mean Secretary of State's office? No, no, Se I'm sorry, Secretary um, Smith. Because he's okay. he's over the Department of Health. Right. Okay. okay. And Nolan is our, our medical money whiz. So he'll if he if there's EMS money to find, Nolan should be able to figure it out. Excellent. Sorry. I'm okay. 
And then I want on... to make sure that you know that he's watching right now, Madam Chair, also. He's what hi Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> so um on Thursday, we won't meet on Wednesday because um the Senate is meeting. Those of you who are lucky enough to go or unlucky enough to go. Well, well wait, wait, are we not is the Senate not meeting on Wednesday? In up at the State House, we were told Wednesday. Yes, that's what I just said. We are not meeting that's Wednesday. Right, but we're meeting because Thursday. the Senate is right. We're we meeting Tuesday and Thursday. We're meeting right. Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. So I forgot today is Monday. Today felt like Tuesday. I know that's <laughs> what, yeah. Are you kidding? I think it's Friday already. <laughs> so we are meeting Tuesday, and what we will be, um, what are we doing Tuesday? Oh, yes, oh, the EMS. EMS. What we just talked about, yeah. Right. So Thursday, what I would like to do is continue the conversation about um, with the vulnerable communities yes. and the Secretary of State per around, particularly around um, the voting protocols and how it will impact a low income people of color, um, the elderly, because they had some concerns, a lot of concerns about the voting protocol and the Secretary of State said that would be a good use of their time. And then um, have Jason and thank you, Brian, for um, being right on top of that and sending Gail the information and talk about those same communities and how their the census might be impacting them. Does that make sense for Thursday? Yep. Yeah. yeah. And then what did, Gail, what did I say for Friday? I can't even remember now. What about licenses, any additional licenses? I don't, I think we're kind of done with that issue, but I just wanted to make sure there wasn't anything else on uh, that we needed to do other than the marriage license issue. <laughs> no, we thought we were done with that because OPR didn't ask for any other licenses. Right, right. Okay. I mean, OPR can extend any licenses right. over which they have control. Right. And we haven't been asked by anybody else except the electricians and plumbers. <laughs> So the only so thing that we're looking at for Friday is the uh, reviewing EMS issues and looking at hopefully some language. Oh, if we if we end up to, uh, tomorrow coming up with anything that we might um, put into a bill for EMS for the next next Senate yeah. um, session, and then let's also then um, actually look at marriage licenses. Chris, does that work on Friday? Yeah, the you saw the email I forwarded. Yeah, yeah. Um, it, it's a fairly discreet issue, but if you're interested in getting married, it's an issue at the moment. So, but I, I'm puzzled why, it, given that it's a town license, why it isn't covered by the flexibility we enabled in the, our original bill. But that was around deadlines. Oh, and not and not issuing the license in the first place is my understanding. Is that right, Betsy Ann? I thought we gave towns more flexibility on on all of that. Don't, remember, we talked about dog licenses and extending. Yeah, but that's that's extending the time. I think. Yeah. There isn't a, so, a time for marriage licenses. If you want to get married, you have to get a marriage license and it has to be signed. And and that is a local municipal authority. The town clerks sign it, but right now, according to um, some town clerks, they, they're they supposed to be signing in person, right? Right. So here's another license that, uh, that may or may not, it, it hasn't come up, but I, I'm wondering if it's an issue at all with the alcohol and the uh, licenses, are the, or are those simply no. deadlines? Those are deadlines. Okay, great. Okay. Chris? Those... You were muted, Chris. Chris. Well, the, it's gone. I said, Gail, I don't want to alarm you, but there's a bear in your <laughs> Yeah, she's a little. <laughs> um, 
Is okay. A dog, but it's the size of a bear. <laughs> it's very furry. Is, is your dog bigger than you are, Gail? No, she just looks bigger on screen. <laughs> She's only about 40 pounds. It's funny how pictures always make you look fatter. <laughs> I'm I'm really only about 90 pounds. <laughs> okay, anything else, committee, that um, we need to address today? All set. Nope. All set. All right. Thank you very much. I will send this out and Gail add marriage licenses to Friday. Got it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank Thanks you, everybody. And, and tomorrow, are we 1 or 1.30? 1. I think we did 1.30 today because um, for, for I think it was Brian that suggested that it might give right. Betsy Ann a chance to actually breathe between it, Elkar and this. And yeah. Senator Bray. Yeah. Oh, and Senator Bray was the hero here? Okay. Well, to be fair, I thought more about Betsy than Chris, but... <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> Might take him. A tougher job than I did. <laughs> okay, so um, Tuesday right. at one, Thursday at one, and Friday at one. Right, and we've and got then, permission for all those from the pro temps office. Right, and and then we have joint rules this afternoon at four, and all Senate tomorrow morning at eight thirty. Right? Okay, I guess I've had and, to I've right. had to not listen to everything that all the joint rules and stuff because I'm getting so overwhelmed. But but I, I missed you this morning, Jeanette, in our all Senate call. I know, and I assume that Anthony did a wonderful job reporting where we were. Beautiful. He, he it was adequate. <laughs> oh, it was good. No, no, he's thumbs up. So, and you know, I, I just have to tell you that I had a conversation with um, the pro tem because I was a little bit nervous about us kind of thinking that we might be the conduit or the funnel for vulnerable communities around because it's hard for them to know where to go often. And since we're government operations, it seemed that we could fill that role. And the pro tem actually, I don't know if he talked about it this morning or not, but he actually said he thought that was a, he, um, on the third floor that um, he thought it was a wonderful idea because those communities are having a really hard time knowing where to go. And that if we could um, help in that in any way, it would be a good idea. So sure. I was pleased to hear that. Sure. So, yeah. okay, I gotta run. All right, All right. take it easy. Okay. Bye. 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 Bye.